Uh, I'm a 68 Whiskey Fox 3 uh, flight medic for the U.S. Army. Okay, and you were deployed. Um, can you talk about your uh, mm -hmm. deployment in the uh, pre-deployment training that you... Uh, we deployed to Fort Hood, Texas, uh, I'm sorry, mobilized to Fort Hood, Texas prior to our deployment in Afghanistan. Uh, we mobilized in August of 2015, Fort Hood for approximately 40 days. Um, train up prior to that had been a global medic exercise that we had done. Uh, it was our unit annual training event that we had. And uh, as far as medical training while at Fort Hood, uh, we'd done um, specific training within the, the platoon itself, the forward support medical platoon that we deployed with to uh, with the, the medics internally and then um, we had the BCT3 training at, at Fort Sam while we were there at Fort Hood and then the um, Hood Mo Brigade did a, like a MASCAL exercise as our validation exercise while we were there. Okay. Matt, can you talk a little bit about your, uh, w what is your medical background? You know, when you became a medic, what your uh, prior medical experience is? So I became a medic in 2011. I uh, went to a 68 Whiskey Transition Program at Camp Shelby, Mississippi. Prior to that, I was uh, 11 Bravo. And uh, prior medical experience from that was a uh, registered nurse, graduated from uh, Spencerian College of Nursing in 2009. Uh, worked med search for a couple of years and then transitioned into emergency room care as an RN. And uh, Army-wise, I've had the Army's Flight Medic Program and the JEC program, um, as well as the uh, 2CF7 course, which is the medevac doctrine course. So you, um, w when you deployed to Afghanistan, um, where were you at and how long were you in country before this event happened? We deployed to Afghanistan in September, uh, the middle of September 2015. We had been there for uh, approximately three and a half months um, before this event happened. Okay. Can you talk about some of the, uh, the, the, the day's events leading up to this uh, actual event? Uh, the, the days leading up were just normal days for us. We run 24-hour medevac operations. We uh, we'd had a couple calls prior to that over the, the months before. Uh, they weren't regular calls. We weren't getting calls every day. We weren't getting calls every week. Sometimes we may get two calls a week and then go a couple weeks without another call um, to go evacuate someone. The days prior to this were just kind of normal, event, uh, normal events that we would typically do. The, um, we would usually get some sort of a mission briefing that would, that would tell us that the ground forces were going out, so we were able to prepare and get ready and uh, be on essentially a higher alert than we normally were when we knew that ground forces were actually outside and um, the possibility to be in, you know, uh, injured or engaged in combat existed. Prior to this, what was the, uh, the longest period of time that you've taken care of a patient? Approximately 20 minutes. We, uh, not very long at all as far as um, patient care in the back of the helicopter prior to that. So are you wanting an experience like maybe in the emergency room as well or just the Army side? Yeah, the emergency room as well. So in the emergency room, we can, we can have patients uh, that vary from an hour that we'll have as part of our care up to 10, 12 hours, an entire shift depending on how busy the hospital is. So we could have to manage a critical patient in the emergency room for our entire shift if, if we can't find an ICU room or, or some other room to get the patient transferred to. So can you kind of compare and contrast uh, what you do in the emergency room as a nurse to what you do as a flight medic? Uh, the, the type of emergency room that I work in doesn't necessarily deal with a lot of trauma. We do more, uh, we're in a chest pain, accredited chest pain and accredited stroke center. That, and, and we see a wide variety of patients, abdominal pain, and to all the way down to like I, I stub my toe on, uh, on, on something on the floor, all the way up to someone who's in, in a full cardiac arrest and, you know, we're having to work up. Uh, the occasional trauma does come through the door, not by EMS because there's a local trauma center, but we do get uh, personnel who are dropped off of the emergency room that do have, you know, trauma. Is, is there a big difference in the, uh, the team environment of the ER compared to what you experience in the back of a helicopter? Yes, uh, the, the team environment in the emergency room when a critical patient, we, we work off of the uh, emergency severity index in the emergency room. So we have category one through five, one being the most critical, five being the the, the lowest priority patient that would come through. I, I discussed the stub toe, so that would be a, a level five, and a level one would be someone who's an active STEMI, heart attack, uh, you know, who's, who's having an acute stroke, 
or someone who's in active cardiac arrest. And uh, the team environment there would be pretty much all hands on deck. The doctor comes in the room, all of, every available nurse comes in the room, all the techs that are available and everyone works as a team to knock that patient out uh, and get everything taken care of. So it's one big team effort and uh, it's still chaos, but it's a little bit of controlled chaos versus my experience in the Army so far is you have a medic and a crew chief in the back of the helicopter and your crew chief can essentially help you uh, with what you've trained them to do. So their ability to help you in the back of the helicopter uh, comes out to what you've trained them to do. Can, can you compare the, uh, the environment of the emergency room compared to what you experience uh, in the back of the helicopter uh, in Afghanistan? The environment of an emergency room is everything is well lit. Uh, everything is uh, placed in the same spot and, and there's a supply chain so it's easier to get things. So if you run out of something you, make, you can make a phone call and you can, you can potentially get that kind of quickly versus in the back of a helicopter. Many times it's cramped, it's hard to move around especially if you have multiple patients. We do keep all of our gear um, that, that our platoon had in the back of our helicopter stocked a certain way to where every medic knows where everything is in the helicopter at that point. So if one medic were to come off a helicopter because he was sick or he erfed out on hours or something, then another medic could jump on the back of the helicopter and know exactly where everything is in that helicopter and not have to be told what, you know, what to do or where to go. He would know where everything is. The other downside to in the back of a helicopter is, is noise and light, well not necessarily noise discipline, but light discipline in the back of a helicopter. If it's you know in the middle of the night and you're going into a potentially hot HLZ, you don't want to be uh, have the, the cabin or the cockpit of the aircraft lit up. You want to go in dark, pick up your patients, and then you're treating a patient with maybe a small light in the back of the aircraft so you don't have that, um, that very well lit area that you can see the potential injuries on your patient and, and you only have your set of eyes and maybe the crew chief's eyes to, to see any potential injuries that may be on the patients, unlike in the emergency room where you have a lot of eyes who are looking at the patient and so they can you know, potentially catch more injuries. So going to the uh, events of that day, um, what, 5 January? Correct. Right. Um, can you kind of describe that day and uh, start going, you know, go through the sequence of uh, what happened, what led you to the uh, casualty? Yes, sir. Um, so that morning, um, I had been awakened by our 15 Papa, which is our operations um, personnel. They're, they were told to, to uh, wake myself and the commander up. I was the platoon sergeant that day or not that day, just in general for the deployment. Uh, one of the CCRs for um, troops in contact was to wake myself and the, the platoon leader up. So uh, they were just following procedures. He came in, uh, knocked on the door. We worked a general night shift, so this was around 9 a.m. in the morning, I believe, that he, he knocked on the door, uh, woke me up, and you know, let me know that there was a troops in contact. I immediately left my room and went and tried to check out the situation to kind of see what was going on to see if we needed to, to get ready for anything. At that point, it was just a troops in contact. So we, uh, we checked that, confirmed that there was troops in contact. And then uh, a few minutes later, we saw that an American service member had been wounded and they were gonna call up a nine line at that. And um, so we knew that this was in our area and we were gonna get the call. Uh, we went ahead and woke everyone up who was on the crew that day and had them get ready and wait for the nine line to come down. So we were essentially already at fly in the helicopters, ready to go. Um, prior to even getting the nine line that day that, that came down through the transverse like they would normally do. How far away was it time of flight? Time of flight was approximately 15 minutes from our location. Uh, the, the injury sustained that day was in the uh, city of Marja in the Helmand province of Afghanistan. The weather that day was not questionable, but the clouds were um, kind of low lying. We flew in you know, identified the compound by the smoke that they had thrown, uh, did our circle, and then made our approach in to uh, the compound that day. Okay, so. can you describe uh, what you saw from the air as you were coming in to the compound? As we were coming into the compound, uh, you could see a lot of movement, movement inside the compound. Uh, my job as a medic is to fly on the left side of the aircraft and clear the aircraft on the left side to make sure that we don't have any obstacles or there aren't any enemy or anything that are engaging us so we can we can break away or move away to to do the the appropriate um, actions coming into the compound i could see there was a lot of movement coming around as we were coming in it's okay 
as we were coming into the compound that day, I could see that there was a lot of movement going on inside the compound. And uh, as we were coming in, uh, my, like I said, my job was to clear the aircraft. So I looked back as we were coming inside the compound and cleared the tail down on the left side because our tail was inside. As I swept back forward to clear the blades on the left side, I noticed that there was a U.S. service member with what appeared to be a 240 um, type machine gun who was firing outside of the compound and uh, announced that over the radio to the crew members and then cleared the blades down on the left side of the aircraft. Once the aircraft landed, um, I released my seatbelt, turned to move toward the door to get permission to move out of the aircraft and then started feeling a sudden vibration, like a very rough vibration. I uh, looked back to my side, wasn't sure if we had taken an RPG or something, it just was very odd. My left side of the aircraft was clear, I looked back to the right side and that's when I noticed that the blades were striking the side of the building. I immediately announced that the blades were striking the right side of the building and the pilots performed an emergency engine shutdown. Once that was done, the blades had stopped, everyone exited the aircraft. Once we were outside the aircraft, I did a real quick sweep of everyone um, that was a member of the crew just to make sure there were no uh, obvious injuries, asked everyone if they were okay. They said yes and then I made my way to find the 18 Delta to get my report on the patient to see if they needed my help at that point. So, Did anybody from the uh, compound come out to guide you in? or? Uh, we were inside the compound. Mm -hmm. They were still moving toward the helicopter when mm -hmm. the blades were turning and all the debris was being knocked off the building. Our crew chief quickly put his hand out to stop them. And then once, once we got the aircraft shut down, we uh, explained to them that, that we had struck the side of the building and that we weren't going to be flying the helicopter out of there that day. At that point, uh, I assumed care. I spoke to the 18 Delta and I assumed care for the patient. Uh, we were in a pretty heavy and intense firefight. They were, uh, um, from my understanding, surrounding the compound at that point as well. And uh, I felt that the 18 Delta had better suited fighting and uh, keeping the enemy away from us and, and I could control the patient at that point. So. so your helicopter actually landed in the compound? We did, okay. that's correct. Um, and I assume the uh, the patient was in one of the rooms. Uh, he was within the compound. That's correct. So what was what a patient report did the uh, 18 Delta give? The 18 Delta told me that the patient had sustained a gunshot wound. Um, initially, he had he had said through and through um, on the right thigh. The tourniquet was in place. They had a um, they had a, a dressing on it, and that he had given him ketamine. TXA, it started the first round of TXA and he had, he had given him ketamine. And did, did he indicate how long ago the uh, patient was wounded? He, uh, I don't remember in that conversation, but, but I know that uh, we landed around a little after 10 in the morning. So uh, I think at this point it was around 30, between 30 and 45 minutes that the patient had been uh, injured. And um, there wasn't a whole lot of conversation about uh, amount of blood loss at that point, so he had just uh, informed me that the tourniquet was in place, the bleeding was controlled, they had a dressing on it, he had given TXA and ketamine to the patient. What kind of IV access did the uh, patient have at that he point? He had an 18 gauge in the left AC. So w once you came upon the patient, uh, what did you see? Uh, what I saw when I immediately saw the patient was a patient who was trying to, to climb off the litter, was a little bit confused, asking a lot of questions and there were some people next to him who were trying to just kind of calm him down and, and console him a little bit and tell him that everything was going to be okay. Was he the only casualty at that point? He was the only casualty at that point, yes. All right. So, um, As you started assessing your uh, patient, what did you find? So very quickly I dropped down to his right side, um, you know, just took a real quick look at him. He was talking, so that let me know his airway was okay. It looked like he had good chest rise and fall. Uh, I, I went to Phillips to check see if he had a radial pulse. I could not find a radial pulse initially. Uh, and that's as far as I made it on the initial assessment. They told us that we were going to be moving, that the second helicopter that was our chase bird that day was going to try and land and, extra, or, or, and evac us out of the situation as well. So we immediately picked him up, moved to an opening in the compound, and um, set the patient back down there in the opening. I immediately started working on the patient again, again, you know, just reassess the interventions, make sure the tourniquet was still working. The tourniquet was good at that point. It wasn't bleeding. There was no issues. It was in place. The, um, just looked at it again there again. He was, he seemed confused. Um, he was very cold to the touch. He was pale, somewhat diaphoretic, and uh, still could not find a radial pulse on him. 
And at that point, I made the determination that I would go ahead and try and start some blood on him. In the meantime, uh, while I was getting everything ready to, to get the blood uh, ready to give to him, I thought that maybe he was having a, a bad trip from the ketamine that the, um, that the 18 Delta had given him. So I thought I would maybe give him a touch of her sed to try and just kind of calm him down in case he was having a, 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 a bad reaction to the ketamine. That did absolutely nothing for him. So in, in, in hindsight, like he was in, in shock. So, um, you know, I gave him the blood. Um, we had trained our crew chiefs to help us um, spike the blood. So while I was uh, working to give him the Versed, my crew chief was, was spiking the blood, priming the tubing and everything for me to, to go ahead and give, setting up the uh, blood flowing warmer, the inflows that we use to, to warm the fluid as we give it to him. So, so as part of the, uh, the blood program that you guys have on the aircraft, what do you normally carry? We carry either two units of O positive or O negative blood. Any uh, fresh frozen plasma or thawed plasma, anything like that? We do not. Yeah. Um, and you said you use inflow IV warmers, Correct. inline warmers? Correct. We carry two of those and two batteries on our aircraft. That, that's just our unit specific. That's not uh, um, Army-wide. So. What's used on most uh, air medevac aircraft in the Army? Uh, it's split right now between um, the inflow fluid warmer or the not the bear hugger, the uh, uh, thermal angel uh, warmers. Okay. So I know the National Guard that came in to Kandahar were using the thermal angels. They didn't have the inflow fluid warmers. Okay. So you were given the, uh, the first unit of blood uh, waiting on the uh, second aircraft to land? Correct. Um, what happened then? So we were there, I, I can't tell you, I, I, I don't know exactly how much time we were there, but we were there waiting on the second aircraft to land. Uh, the SF guys around us were talking about how they were low on ammo, they were low on smoke. I gave them, I, I carry smoke in, in my vest, uh, just in case I'm ever on the ground and need to, to mark for the aircraft to come back and get me. So I gave them the current smoke that I had so they could throw for the other aircraft and then gave them all of my magazines except for the one that I had in my weapon and uh, the one that I had in my M4 and then the, of course the one that I had in my M9 to kind of help them out. The rest of the air crew did the same. I continued, um, you know, giving the blood to the patient, trying to reassess the patient, see how he was doing. At the same time, trying to do a quick uh, head to toe assessment on the patient to make sure there's no other injuries or anything that I noted on him at that point. And um, like I said, we were in the opening of a compound and you know, started noticing some, some debris and stuff flying off the wall beside us. It was kind of hitting me on the back of the neck. Turned around, you know, hearing the crack and pop of the, the bullets and stuff as they're, as they're closely coming by and kind of turn around. There's a tracer round burning out at my feet. And that's the conversation we had earlier where I was like, you know, it's time for me to get, time for me to get as small as I can. We were still inside the safety of the compound, but to, just barely at that point. Uh, they were still trying to land the other helicopter. I had my um, embedder radio hooked up and I was trying to announce to the other aircraft that I had initiated vampire protocols and that I needed them to, to call that up to let them know that the, the patient was critical at this point. Uh, I was unable to communicate with them but I could hear them talking and they were sustaining rounds every attempt they, they took to land to pick us up and uh, then I heard um, them call return to base. They had sustained too much damage to land the aircraft and they were going to have to return to base. So at that point we made the decision to move back inside the compound uh, and back inside the building. We moved back inside the building. I was given, uh, but this time I was on the second unit of blood. After the first unit I still didn't note a radio pulse. He was still cool, pale, uh, somewhat confused. We moved back inside the compound. Uh, Realized that I had some resources in the aircraft that I could use. I still had the ProPak and the Zol, and um, asked my crew chief to go retrieve the ProPak for me. He went into, uh, or he went outside the little building that we were in to go retrieve the ProPak. Immediately came back inside after a loud explosion. Uh, they had landed a mortar round inside the compound that had went through the stabilator of the aircraft that was parked right next to the building. He then jumped right back up and ran back out after that was done and, and grabbed the ProPak and brought it back in so we could get a better better assessment on the vital signs that we had on the patient at that point. So 
I finished the second unit of blood. After the second unit of blood, the patient started to pink up some. He started to become a little more alert and oriented, was able to answer more questions and not act as confused as he was prior to. Uh, when, I, when I received the patient, he was also wrapped in the, uh, dang, I'm drawing a blank now. HPMK. HPMK, yeah, he was wrapped in an HPMK when I received the patient. So I um, just made sure that he was secure and warm and um, just trying to get him warm back up and trying to reverse the effects of shock that I was seeing. So, uh, you know, after that was kind of done, he started complaining of a lot of pain. Um, so uh, I started treating his pain with fentanyl at that point and uh, just tried to, to, you know, keep him somewhat alert and oriented and at the same time decrease his pain so I could just keep a good assessment on his, on his mental status. How much time do you think it had elapsed at this point? How long have you been on the ground? Uh, we had probably been on the ground close to an hour at this point. Uh, I'd given the blood pretty quickly. I had um, um, squeezed it in, the, the method of uh, putting it between the hands and, and pressing and trying, trying to get the blood to come through fairly quickly. Uh, once the second unit of blood was done, I put him on some fluids and just um, kind of KVO just to kind of, you know, keep them hydrated and those kind of things throughout the day. So at this point, they were, they were going to try to make a second attempt to uh, bring a med you know, another medevac where to try and come evac us. So at this point, it was just a waiting game for them to kind of show up. So I tried to just, um, you know, assess him, make sure that, you know, his ABCs were good, you know, and then uh, make sure he was just comfortable but, but not unconscious. So. Were there any other casualties at, at this point? At this point, there were no, well, potentially another casualty, the one that I didn't see. Uh, the IRDSF guys rumbling about uh, an Afghan soldier, commando, who had uh, potentially been shot in the foot at that point, but they were, they were treating him. Okay. So. Kind of describe the environment that you were treating uh, within this mud hut. Uh, so inside the, the mud hut, uh, we had him laying on a, on a talon litter system. Um, and uh, we were just right in front of the door that way it was easy access just to get him in and out. There was some real weird pot stove or something that was in the center that the, the family that lived there used, I guess, for heat. Uh, and then the room was maybe 10 feet wide by 15 feet long. And so there were, uh, um, you know, different personnel in and out of that room throughout the, throughout the day, so. Was there good light? There was no light, uh, uh, except for what came from the small little window that was there during the day, uh, and then the door that was in the opening when, you know, you could leave the door cracked a little bit from the opening there and, and, and get some light in and out of that. So the visibility was not terrific, but it was, it was usable enough. What about um, the uh, noise level, temperatures? Inside the room, so in the helmet it stays pretty warm year-round. Uh, I, I, I think the temperature got up into the 70s that day, so when midday came around it wasn't bad outside. It was in the low 70s, I believe, so the temperature wasn't bad. We were inside the room, so we were cut off from wind or anything like that. So the temperature was comfortable inside the room. I remember being very hot, but of course I was still in my um, flight vest and body armor and wearing my flight helmet at this point, so I just remember myself being hot. And I remember the patient after, after a couple units of blood and being wrapped up and kind of turning him around after a little bit of fluids, complaining about being hot as well, so. All right, so the uh, further attempts at um, bringing in helicopters didn't work out? Um, it did not. Uh, we were told that the second helicopter uh, was uh, making an approach to come in and they were engaged immediately and that one of the crew members on the aircraft had sustained some injuries and so they were returning to base as well. So that was around the same time that the second American had been injured. Um, I was working inside the uh, room with the current patient that I had and um, taking care of him, patient number one. We were taking care of him, um, just kind of, you know, making sure he was doing okay, making sure the interventions were in place and he still had a good strong radio pulse. Uh, I did have the vital signs machine at that point, but the battery was dying on the ProPack because I'd, I'd used it to get him through kind of the, the most critical time that day. 
and uh, still had the Zola available if I needed it. But uh, just kind of monitoring him, uh, one of the other air crew members came in and said, you know, hey, Matt, we need you outside right now. So uh, my patient was fairly stable at that point. Uh, there was no bleeding. So uh, I asked someone to keep an eye on him. I walked outside, and that's when I saw the other um, soldier who had sustained injuries. I uh, ran over to him quickly, realized that he had, he had sustained a gunshot wound injury to the head. The, the 18 Delta had cracked him already, and they were asking if they could borrow my ventilator. Uh, I, I instructed them that, uh, that the, the, the ventilator probably wasn't the best idea at this point. We could bag him. I had, they were wanting some oxygen as well. I had four uh, D cylinders that we carried on the aircraft. We always like to make sure that we had at least an hour's worth of oxygen for one patient on the aircraft. So I had four D-cylinders on the aircraft. I told them I could give them one, but we were better off just bagging them. At this point, uh, you know, there was a still a, a pretty intense firefight going on around us. The Air Force had been dropping some 500-pound bombs as well as the uh, 105 rounds from their um, AC-130s. And uh, there was still a lot of firing coming into the compound, a lot of firing going out and uh, lots, of, lots of confusion that day. They were bringing mortar, in, mortar rounds in and, our, uh, you know, uh, walking them into our location. We had already had one inside the compound. Uh, someone had mentioned something at the same time that a couple of Afghans had taken some shrapnel and that the 18 Deltas were treating those. So I started thinking about um, the day potentially turning into a mass cow and started, you know, needing to hang on to the, the resources that we had. Uh, he was still breathing, um, but very erratically. He, he showed very much signs of Cushing's syndrome at this point, I'm sorry, Cushing's triad at this point. And, uh, you know, he had a, he had a very, um, like, faint radial pulse, but he did have a radial pulse at that point. And like I said, his, his respirations were erratic. I uh, don't know what his blood pressure was. Uh, but he was cold and um, in wet clothing, so I instructed uh, everyone that we needed to get the wet clothes off of him immediately. So we cut the wet clothes off immediately, put him into an HPMK, wrapped him up. I did a uh, IO in his right humeral head and um, started some fluids on, on him at that point. And we took one D cylinder and hooked it up and gave him a couple liters through the D cylinder as, we were, um, as they were bagging him through the, the crack that the 18 Delta had done. Were, were there any signs of uh, impending herniation? Or, uh, um, his, pu his pupils were fixed and dilated. Mm -hmm. There was no response at all on, on uh, his pupils when, when I, I tried to check them. So, uh, and other than that, you know, I just, his, his heart rate was very, very low, very faint. I remember counting in the 40s was his heart rate. So, um, you know, I kind of was thinking in the back of my mind that, that he had possibly already started to herniate at that point. I suggested that maybe you could hyperventilate him a little bit, but um, you know, it's kind of hard to explain to, to some guys who are really trying to work really hard to save their friend uh, who had just sustained injuries that, that we need to kind of keep an eye on resources and, and, and not use a whole lot because uh, you know, the day could potentially create more casualties and, and we would need to be able to treat them as well. How long did the uh, 18 Deltas uh work on that casually? Um, so I, I want to say he, he lived approximately four hours or so after sustaining those injuries and um, I asked if, if they would like to bring him into the room with me and I could I could keep an eye on him as well as keep an eye on my patient. They said no they wanted to keep the two separate. I think the two were friends, very close friends. Um, my, my casualty was a, an Air Force JTAC and then he of course was a JTAC for the uh, uh, SF and uh, so I think they were close friends, and they said no, they wanted to keep them separated. And so they would occasionally, uh, I think they, I'm not sure what they did for as far as providing care, but I know that one of our pilots ended up um, doing most of the bagging for him. And then after a couple hours, they, they called on me again to come in and um, see if I could find a pulse. And, and I could not find a, a, a pulse on him at all. And they said they couldn't either, but they just wanted to kind of have someone else back them up on it to make sure that, you know, um, someone else couldn't find a pulse on it. So, When he sustained the injury, we were somewhere around um, four hours into the event at this point. Um, and then we were told that they weren't going to be uh, getting us out of there, that it, they were probably going to have to wait till dark to be able to, to come um, and get us out of the compound that day. 
At that point, um, you know, he had had the tourniquet on his leg for around four hours, and I made the determination, or the decision, rather, to uh, convert the tourniquet, to, to try and save his leg, and um, see if we could convert the tourniquet at that point. Uh, grabbed one of the 18 Deltas, um, brought him into the room with me, um, you know, talked him through my plan, told him that my plan was to give him a fluid bolus to try and um, help him out a little bit to, to dilute any pollutants that, that may come through when we release the tourniquet. Um, so started a little fluid bolus, knew it would be very painful, so I gave him some fentanyl and some Versed at that point to try and uh, take him out of the situation so he wouldn't remember that because I knew it was going to be very painful. Uh, gave him the medication, waited, uh, I think almost, well, somewhere between five and ten minutes is what I waited, and then started to pack the wound, expose the wound, kind of look at it, started to pack the wound with combat gauze, and um, uh, applied pressure to the combat gauze. I remember just thinking in my head, they always say three to five minutes, but I'm going to be really safe. I'm going to go ahead and sit here and hold pressure for five minutes. So uh, packed it, uh, held pressure for five minutes, and then wrapped one good, strong, tight wrap of uh, ace wrap around that and slowly started to back off the tourniquet and just watched for bleeding. At first it looked like it was working and the bleeding was controlled, but after a little while I started to see a little blood come up and then so I just marked it and the blood just continued to, to grow. Uh, and so I, I made the determination to just go ahead and reapply the tourniquet at that point. Uh, while the tourniquet was off, I did check for um, the uh, um, CSM, the uh, RPMS, whatever the Army calls it these days. I don't know. I don't think I can call it PMS anymore. I'm sorry. Uh, but I did check for um, uh, some motor issue, you know, to make sure the motor was there, make sure sensory stuff was there, make sure he could wiggle his toes, do pedal pushes, pedal pulls, those sorts of things. That was off, and he was able to perform all that as well. He could tell me which toe I was touching, and um, Everything looked good at that point, but the bleeding was still not controlled, so I made the determination to put the tourniquet back on at that point. Did you use the uh, same tourniquet or anyone? I did. Anyone? I used the same tourniquet was mm -hmm. there at that point. I just reapplied the tourniquet and, uh, uh, you know, just uh, continued to monitor the patient and treat, treat his pain throughout the day here. What kind of a uh, tourniquet was it? It was a cat. And you didn't have any problems with it bending, uh, the windlass bending or anything I like that? I did not. It was one of the red tip cats that they had with the upgraded windlass on it, so it, it worked well at that point. Right. How far away from the wound was the uh, tourniquet? Uh, the tourniquet was about three inches above the wound. Yeah. All right, so the uh, tourni first tourniquet conversion attempt uh, didn't work. Uh, how was his pain when you were uh, packing the wound? Uh, very, very intense. He was screaming. Uh, was not comfortable at all uh, and, and very upset about the situation, but at the same time was very adamant about keeping his legs. So uh, he understood the, you know, that the pain was going to come with it, but was was definitely willing to, for you know, uh, undergo the pain to to try and convert the tourniquet to save his legs. So. Would you say that the uh, the tourniquet easily controlled the uh, bleeding? Yes, the tourniquet did easily control the bleeding. Right, so um, what, what happened after that? So after that, we just uh, monitored the patient. Uh, I didn't mention earlier, but while mm -hmm. I was um, slowly releasing the tourniquet on him, I was monitoring his vital signs, uh, checking blood pressures frequently, checking the heart rate frequently, checking his SpO2 to make sure I didn't, that he didn't go hypotensive or have any issues. From that immediate um, release of uh, the, the blood that had been contained inside the leg that day, and uh, so just for, for another couple hours, I think it was around two hours, I just uh, kind of kept an eye on him, uh, tried to treat his pain. If he had any, just, you know, keep him stable like he was before. Uh, and, and then throughout all of this, there, there still was a firefight that was going on outside. There was talk of when we were going to get out of there, when we were going to get resupplied, and we had no idea on, on any of those. There were ideas that they were throwing around. I, you know, that they're coming to get us now, that's changed, that plan's not going to work anymore. So there's a lot of, there was, the SF guys were giving us the communication on what they knew as far as the plan to come get us out of there, and they were keeping us up to date, but the problem was is the plan was changing so much above our head that it was just really hard to kind of keep up with what was happening. So I just kind of hunkered down for the long haul and didn't know when we were going to get out of there, but, you know, just 
do my best to treat the patient. Um, I also, at this point, uh, had already started the second round of TXA on him and uh, was, was letting the TXA go in as well. I'd given him uh, antibiotics in vans to try and treat any infection. I had, I had heard that there was a pretty nasty bug that you would sometimes get from the soil in Hellman that a lot of soldiers were really fighting some sepsis and stuff with. And so I wanted to go ahead and get on top of that and get some antibiotics in his system and, and hopefully we could combat that, um, you know, right away, so. So at this point, I guess, I guess you're probably eight hours into it? Uh, well, not quite at this yeah. point, because I, I think I made another attempt mm -hmm. um, at around six or seven hours to, to back the tourniquet off again and see if I could get some, uh, see, see if the bleeding would have been controlled at that point. Um, this time, I, when I, this, the second time that I tried to convert the tourniquet, I backed it off, monitored for bleeding, and went ahead and removed more of the clothing around that was around that area and um, uh, switched out the tourniquet at this point to uh, a soft T wide and, and uh, just monitored and, and realized that one of the things that, that I that didn't mention to tell you at the, at the beginning is, is one of the, um, when he initially thought that it was a through and through at the beginning, um, there was a hard mass that was on the bottom side of the tourniquet and didn't know if that was a hematoma or what was going on with it. Uh, but the tourniquet was wrapped around it and it was applied and bleeding was controlled. Uh, we found out and discovered that once we cut everything and tore everything away, that that hard mass was a five-hour energy bottle that was on the back side of that. So we were, you know, we removed all that, cut it away, and reapplied the soft tea. And uh, the tourniquet was significantly more comfortable for him. <laughs> It still wasn't comfortable, but it was a little more comfortable for him right. once that was removed out of the way. So, there, um, looking back on it, there are a lot of things that, when it when it comes to an assessment of a patient, you know, I didn't really want to mess with a tourniquet that was doing its job to to try and yank a patient around for a really good assessment. You know, uh, my assessment really was more feeling, opening things up, and looking than it was yanking the patient back and forth. And I didn't want to take a chance on on tearing that tourniquet away and if it was a severe arterial bleed that, that you know, take a chance at losing life or losing more blood because of a, a silly mistake. So, you know, my, my initial assessment of the patient was is that there was no other bleeding in the, in the current area was that the bleeding was controlled. So, you know, going back and actually cutting the clothes away and finding the five-hour energy bottle that was wrapped up in a ball underneath the tourniquet, um, you know, I guess that would be something that you could look back on later and you know, think, well, you know, but how, I don't know, how, how, how can you get around that or, or whatever, but the tourniquet was on and it was working and I didn't want to mess with that, so. So did your second tourniquet conversion succeed? It did not. Um, watched it for a while and it just continued to bleed. Uh, and then for the rest of the day, it was just a, a every two hours or so, it was just the same thing, give a small fluid bolus to the patient and try and monitor the patient to see if we had uh, uh, bleeding that was controlled to see if there were any signs and symptoms of, of you know, kidney involvement from releasing the tourniquet and releasing the toxins into the kidney. And that's the approach that I went. I just, when I, when I went to convert it, I, I kind of thought about crush principal injuries and, and how, you know, if you're gonna treat someone who's got a crush injury, what you wanna do, give them fluids and try and dilute, you know, any, any toxins that may be in there and um, monitor for blood pressure issues, those kind of things. Uh, check for, uh, you know, uh, urine output on the patient. Uh, he was able to urinate earlier in the day with no issues. We, we used a, a water bottle, cut the top off of a water bottle, and he was able to go into the water bottle. He, you know, was able to set up just a little bit. I didn't want to move him around too much to, didn't want to create, like I said, an issue with the, the tourniquet, but he was able to, to urinate in the water bottle once during the day, but then after that, uh, his kidney still continued to make urine, but he was unable to urinate uh, and just had a lot of pressure built up th throughout the day. But I knew that he at least, his kidneys were working, they were functioning, so um, that was good for me to know at that point, so. Did, did any of the uh, tourniquet conversions uh, succeed? Yes, uh, so the last one, uh, I wanna say it was around midnight, uh, finally worked. 
um, I released the tourniquet and it actually was, uh, the bleeding was controlled at that point and so uh, I left the tourniquet in place but loosened to where I could, uh, could quickly tighten it again if I had any involvement or any bleeding beyond that point. So, um, you know, at that point it, it did work and we tried to keep movements to a, to a minimum to, as to not um, create any issues to where it would, it would ruin the clot that we had created at that point. So, uh, every tourniquet conversion that I did throughout the day, uh, I did checks to see if he had strong pulses and he, he had um, pedal pulses. He was able to do pedal pushes, pulls, identify toes that I was touching, wiggle his feet, move them around, do what I needed to. So. Uh, we were able to maintain good circulation uh, when the tourniquet was released. So when we talk about prolonged field care, one of the uh, things we talk a lot about is nursing care. Um, were there examples of things that you did as, as with your background as a nurse that um, medics wouldn't normally do or think about? Um, I felt very comfortable using drugs other than morphine to, to treat his pain. I initially used fentanyl to treat his pain. Uh, I used 650 micrograms of fentanyl throughout the day to treat his pain. Eventually used every bit of it that I had. Uh, tried to transition to morphine and um, uh, morphine would not do anything for his pain at all at that point. Uh, so one of the things that I had used in the hospital setting before is ketamine and I felt very comfortable using ketamine. So at that point I created a drip uh, of ketamine to, to use on him and so that uh, I was very comfortable doing that. I, I knew that ketamine was a good drug. And looking back on it now, I wish that I had used the ketamine drip the entire day. I, I carried a thousand milligrams of ketamine with me, and plus the 18 deltas has some ketamine that I could have used as well. Uh, it, it controlled his pain better than the fentanyl did. It, it took his level, pain level, uh, most of the day he averaged an eight, nine, sometimes a 10 on his pain. With the ketamine, it would take his pain down to as much as four, five, or six. And uh, he was very lucid in and out of sleep, and so it seemed to work very well for him. Uh, his, his mental status for me with the ketamine was okay. I, I knew there was going to be a little bit of uh, an amnesia sort of factor with that where he, he may wake up, ask me a question, doze back off, wake up, ask me that question again. But uh, at least I had you know, a, a good feeling of his mental status at that point, and uh, you know, it can just maintained good, strong vital signs throughout the day. Can you describe how you made the drip? So yeah, I took, uh, uh, I carry 100, C or 100 milliliter bags of normal saline in my, um, in my kit. So I would just mix 100 of normal saline with 100 of ketamine, so. And you just titrated that to his effect? Mm -hmm. what, what did you base the, the effect off of? Uh, the pain control and, and the, the in and out of sleep for me, uh, he was, uh, didn't seem to be uncomfortable other than the, the fact that he had to urine or that he had to urinate. He, uh, he seemed to be comfortable, relaxed. He, he um, didn't show any anxiety about the situation. He just seemed kind of comfortable and so I kept him there. If, if he started to get a little bit uh, get a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit antsy, want to move, I would, I would you know turn the drip up slightly on him and if he started to get a little sleepier than I wanted him to be, I would back the drip off some. So. Was he on the litter the entire time? He was. Uh, any efforts to pad the litter or anything like that? Um, we had some stuff that, that you know, we just kind of put some under his, uh, like his lower back and that kind of stuff. And then every now and then we'd just kind of just move him around just a little bit to kind of not create hot spots. Not large movements, but just enough to get off of that spot to just move him just a little bit on his left side or just a little bit on his right side. Uh, did he ever uh, get thirsty or hungry? He did. Uh, he never mentioned anything about wanting to eat. He, he did mention about thirst a couple times. Um, so, you know, would just give him small little, uh, didn't want to give him a lot to drink. I uh, kept reminding him about surgery and he wanted to smoke a cigarette, but I, I wouldn't let him smoke a cigarette. But, uh, um, but I would give him like small capfuls of water just to kind of wet his mouth and those kind of things because for the, for the dry mouth issues that he was having, just to kind of try and keep him comfortable. What about yourself and your, uh, your crewmates? Um, how, how did you guys deal with the, uh, the long term that you took care of the patient, the fatigue? Uh, I don't remember getting tired until um, very, very early in the morning. Um, I, I think it was probably around one or two when a lot of people would come inside the compound, and the, not in the compound, but inside the building and were napping when they weren't pulling security. Uh, crew members took small little cat naps throughout the days or throughout the day 
I, I didn't nap at all. Um, just the adrenaline and my focus on the patient really kept me awake. But when everyone came inside and everyone was kind of laying back and it was quiet and it was dark outside, we had a, a little light that I guess the family who lived there would use. They would hook it up to a battery and it was a little LED light. And it provided me with enough light to be able to look at his leg to make sure it wasn't bleeding and, the, and to see you know, his face and chest rise and fall and that kind of stuff. So it worked out well for me. But I started to get a little tired at that point. Uh, not necessarily sleepy, but just tired and kind of reflect on, you know, holy cow, what kind of day had just, just happened and transpired and all the events. Um, we had uh, a couple bottles of water, or not bottles, but a uh, um, couple packs of water that we, we keep on the aircraft. And uh, the, uh, the SF guys that were on the ground that day were, you know, very thirsty throughout the day. and. Of course, we don't think we're going to be there very long, so we pull all of our water off. And we're like, "Hey guys, take the water. You know, take this water. You guys need to hydrate. You need a drink. You know." Um, so we gave them our water, and then we ended up being there a really long time. And and uh, there was an attempt to resupply us. Uh, the C-130s flew over. They they I guess parachuted a couple pallets or uh, tri walls that they were going to try and land inside the compound of of food and medical supplies and ammo and those kind of things. Initially, it was thought it was going to land inside the compound, but the wind caught that and took it outside the compound. This was still during the day, so there was no way without other injuries being sustained that anyone could get outside the compound to get that. Um, uh, it wasn't until later that evening that we, I thought, as we were sitting around and people were talking about being hungry and being thirsty and those kind of things, that we have scram kits on our aircraft. We have four scram kits, scram kits on the aircraft, which contain some food, some water, and those sort of things that uh, we were able to break out at that point. And so it was not fun, but it was almost kind of fun because we'd never really, you know, we had talked about what was inside of them, but we've never tried the food that was inside of them. So we are water in a pouch, and like a rubber pouch or plastic pouch, drinking that. And so we were able to feed, you know, the SF guys that night too, as far as like giving them little snack bars and there was water and stuff inside the scram kits. So, um, you know, everyone got a little bit to drink toward the end of the night, so. Um, so the total time that you had the casualty on the ground was? 17 hours. And when, when uh, you guys finally did get out of there, how did that go about, or come about? So they brought mm -hmm. Chinooks in to get us out that night. Um, four Chinooks landed. Um, prior to them getting there, we all talked about there were gonna be different teams. There's like a red team, a blue team, a green team, and those would be on the different aircraft. And of course they, they assigned us with um, someone that we had seen, and, and, you know, one of the SF guys that had been been with us the majority of the day. So they assigned us with him, and they were like, "Just make sure you stay with him, follow him. You're going to go to this aircraft." And they took the hero at that point, and they went to a separate aircraft. They had they had kept those two separated throughout the day. Uh, we got in our little chalks, moved outside into an open field that was just south of the compound. And uh, the entire time, um, I'm just, I was continually reassessing that patient, the patient's leg, because the tourniquet was not in place at this point. The bleeding was controlled, and I was just continually monitoring that leg to make sure that the bleeding had stayed controlled. Uh, at the same time, I was using, I had saved one of the blood fluid warmer batteries because I thought the helicopter ride was going to be cold. Uh, hypothermia may be an issue again with this patient. I did, you know, I knew that his his uh, hydration status was better than it was when I got him, and, and we had worked through the, the shock time frame that he was in, but I didn't want to create another issue again. So I saved a blood fluid warmer, and I still had him on the ketamine drip at this point, and uh, in the beginning of the day, I had started an 18, 18 gauge in his right AC when I started the blood initially. So I had, I had the two lines of access, and, and they both worked great. So I was giving him warm fluids, prior to getting on the aircraft. And we got on the aircraft, and uh, um, turns out the Chinooks have the uh, heaters uh, underneath their seats in the back that come out through the floor. So that was uh, an added bonus as far as keeping the patient warm on the, on the transport back, so. So you floor loaded the uh, casualty on the CH-47, and you had to take care of them because you were the only medic on board? Correct. Um, had you ever taken care of a, a patient on, in a 47 before? Uh, I had not taken care of a patient in a 47 before. Uh, we had, at flight medic school, we had messed around with starting IVs on each other in the back of a, a CH-47. The same in the jet course, but not 
uh, actually taking care of a patient. Um, I said that I was the only medic on that day. Um, there was another one of our flight medics that was on that aircraft, but he was up in the front. Uh, they had put a flight medic on each Chinook to send out uh, in case there were other casualties or anybody else needed to be treated, but that medic didn't realize that we were on the back of that aircraft with a patient. He made his way down the hallway and, and realized that we were back there, um, but uh, I provided the care for him on the way back. There was an 18 Delta that sat to my left, but at that time he was just kind of just relaxing and there was really nothing to do at this point other than to monitor his bleeding his ABCs and to make sure that he was comfortable. So, yeah, What happened at the uh, Ford surgical team? Uh, um, so I jumped off the helicopter uh, and ran inside, gave the report to the uh, uh, nurse anesthetist that was working there. They, uh, you know, and of course he was, the only complaint he had at this point was he really had to pee. So they, they put a Foley in him at this point and, and uh, took out, I think around 1,200 cc's at that point, so, uh, but he had been complaining of having to urinate for a while that day, so uh, looking back on that, I, I, you know, felt kind of bad, and that's where we've had the conversation of, you know, like items that I wished I, I would have thought about, because I, I thought about it shortly after that, which would have been to use a soft tip, like suction catheter, and we had some, some uh, lubrication that uh, we could have used to, uh, to relieve his bladder that way, so. Just, just something to think back on, and but I guess there's probably more things that could bother me about that day. But that's one that just really kind of sticks in my head that I wish I would have thought about that while we were out there. Just kind of help take care of that. So, so have you ever heard of uh, any medic um, taking care of a patient as long as you did? No. Did you ever expect uh, anything like this to happen? I did not. What do you think in the future could help prepare medics for something like this? Never say never. <laughs> uh, you know, that's one of the things that, that, that we kind of always talked about was, well, that's not going to happen. You know, like, why do we have all these things on here that, you know, this is never going to happen to us. And a lot of things that I said probably wouldn't happen, happened that day. Um, and so, uh, you know, that was a very uncomfortable situation. To, to look back on um, the things that, that would help out would, would be better training in a clinical environment to um, understand the, the body better, how the body works. You know, um, the 68 Whiskey program teaches you trauma. You know, they, they teach you a little bit of aid station stuff, but it's, it's nothing elaborated that doesn't help you, and the, and the EMT portion doesn't help you understand how the body works and why you need to do certain things when, when the body starts to work against you. And so I think a, a better um, educational program for medics to help understand body processes and why they work that way and why you need to do things. Instead of just telling a medic, you need to do it this way, I think explaining to the medic why you need to do it that way because the body works this way would, would definitely help them out. Um, you know, because you never know what's gonna happen. And uh, if you get stuck there and you don't know you know, what, what's going on or, or truly understand how it's working, you know, it could, could potentially be dangerous for, for yourself and for the patient, so. So how did the uh, casualty do overall for recovery? So what I've been told is uh, that there was very little to minor involvement with um, um, an artery. Um, that, that's what I was told from the, the surgeon that I spoke to that morning. Um, and he said there was just very little. So I'm, I'm not sure why, why we had such a problem controlling the bleeding. Um, but uh, he uh, he'd went on to Germany, then they'd sent him to Walter Reed, and they had agreed to send him home. Uh, I believe it was uh, within uh, probably two weeks, he was, I saw uh, that he was up walking with a cane. And uh, the last I've heard, the update that I heard from the JTS, state TTS conference is that he was able to run two miles in around 17 minutes and that his leg was doing great and um, he's expected to make a, a good recovery and be back on jump status and back to doing what he loves. His big request to me that day was don't let him take my leg and so I'm, I'm glad I could have obliged that for him. So.